Um, we're privileged today to have uh, Jeff Mulligan uh, here from the IPSO Alliance. Uh, Jeff has spoken here a couple of times over the years to uh, uh, talk to us primarily about IoT and, and IPv6 in, in the IoT world. And so certainly a, an area that he's uniquely qualified to uh, talk about on a regular basis. So uh, it'll be a, a very engaging conversation this afternoon. Um, Jeff is a consultant and developer and lecturer in the IoT, uh, also in privacy and security. And, and one of the reasons he was having difficulty to getting me slides this year was because he spent an awful lot of time working with the uh, current administration on the net neutrality rules. So it was a, uh, I keep telling him if if only I had a dollar for every time I had to use that excuse, I yeah. think I'd be in a good shape right now. So yeah. um, anyway, so Jeff is uh, certainly an industry wide expert, and uh, we're fortunate today to to have you uh, be able to fit us into your schedule. Great. And stuff. No. So here's some uh, some great information about IoT. I'm I'm excited to be here. So. Um, I, I, interestingly, right, um, it, it seems they start the evening news um, with, you know, um, uh, good evening. And then, of course, they tell us why it isn't. So, good afternoon, and the current state of affairs for IoT protocols, and uh, um, why it may not be necessarily all good news. A uh, little bit of background, um, thanks, Dan. I've been doing this. How many of you remember something called the ARPANET? <laughs> um, a few of us. Uh, so I brought the first node in the Pentagon up on uh, the old days in the ARPANET. In fact, before it ran TCP IP, it ran something called NCP. Um, and so we were hassling with that and then had to do the cutover um, a while back. And, and everyone's heard of something called IPv6, right? OK, good. So I um, actually worked on the original design of something called SIP, Simple IP, or as some of us called it, Steve's IP, um, which was one of the, the um, contenders for IPv6 and sort of became the basis for it. How many people have heard of 6LOPAN? Oh, only because I've talked here before, right? <laughs> Not because of any, not because you've actually deployed it, or not because you're actually using it. But um, I created Six Lopan, worked that through the IETF as uh, to make it, a, um, um, try to to get it to be a standard. How about Zigbee? How many people actually have Zigbee deployed? Oh, wow, that's that's one installation. One installation. Okay, okay. So so Zigbee is is actually. Right, um, uh, it's both a radio technology and a set of protocols that sit on top of it that are proprietary to the Zigbee Alliance. Though recently, um, and I hate to say that I was a founder because up until recently it used to be completely proprietary, and now they've come along a long way and they're um, actually putting six low pan on top for the smart energy applications. Um, I founded something, I was one of the founders of something called the IPSO Alliance, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Um, and then I took a year off from 2013 to 2014, and I worked at the White House on what the government calls cyber physical systems, which just is an inaccessible term for the Internet of Things. Actually, it is a little different. From their point of view, um, a lot of us think about the Internet of Things as sensors sending data up into big data, using Hadoop, crunching on that, and trying to make some sense out of all of this sensor information. Cyber physical systems actually is more of a, a closed control loop. So taking that information and driving it back into actions within actuators. The, the way I tried to explain it to the folks in DC was, was a lot of times when you're in DC at, at 2 a.m., you're stopped at a light and you're looking and going, why am I waiting here? There's no other cars around. Well, IoT would tell you that you're stopped at a light. Right? They would know that you're there, but they wouldn't do anything about it. CPS would be that there's actually a feedback loop, and it would turn the light green and let you move along. Now, it wouldn't turn all the lights green, because if you're anything like me, I'd just floor it and just, you know. But it would turn each one green along the way so that you travel at the right speed. Um, now, after I left the White House, I'm currently one of the U.S. representatives to the ISO Smart and Sustainable Cities Project, where we're trying to define what is smart and what is sustainable. Um, and actually... We're also trying to find what is a city. I couldn't believe this. I showed up and we spent two months debating about what is a city? Because some people had a view of, well, it's only if it has a mayor. Oh, wait a second. What if you're a village and you have some other, what if, you know, whatever. So um, it's, it's, it's been quite an eye-opening experience. Um, so the IoT. I know we're really talking about V6 and not necessarily about um, just the 
uh, the Internet of Things, but how, how V6 impacts the Internet of Things, and I'll get there. But I think it's, it's interesting to, to try to get an understanding of what is the IoT. Um, for a lot of people, it's this view of it's going to be something intrusive. It's Big Brother. It's 1984. No, no, wait a second. It's 2014 um, coming along. Um, it's just a lot of hype. Or I love this one. It's just a way to sell us more stuff that we really don't need. Um, the, the term was actually coined in 1999 um, by a scientist who was giving a presentation to Procter & Gamble um, about the coming of things. Now, obviously, the IoT, I would argue, still isn't here, or depending on your definition, maybe it has already come. Um, but we also have everybody who's trying to put their own label on it. The Internet of Things, obviously, that's a lot, what a lot of people use. Cisco calls it the Internet of Everything. GE calls it the Industrial Internet. There's also M2M. And I bet you if I asked, we'd have 10 more names out there. Internet of Broke Things. There you go. That's actually, yes. More broke things connected to the Internet. Maybe that's another way to put it. Um, one of the things, though, when I created Six, six Lopan, um, we were, we, again, I was looking at alternatives to proprietary protocols, and, and uh, so I said, well, I think we should use V6 for a number of reasons. Obviously, um, big, great big address space. Now, you can't have a technical talk about V6 without trying to compare how big is right, V6 to V4. Um, and I, and I, I came across this one um, that it, it, at, at a previous event, they held up, a, you know, they had Vint Surf there, and they held up this thing, and they said, here's V4, and then they had this a big longer one saying, this is V6, and it got me thinking. If IPv4, if all the addresses fit on a meter stick, how big would the stick have to be to carry all V6 addresses? Well, the answer is 8.37 trillion light years. Now, how big is that? The entire diameter of the known universe is 80 billion light years. So it's, it's obviously ginormous. Um, the reason I was thinking we needed to do V6 was at the time when I was working on it, the company I worked for was Invensys, and we built smoke detectors, and we were putting out 50 million smoke detectors a year, and we thought it would be really cool to interconnect all of those smoke detectors and do something smart with it. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be sort of smart if your smoke detector goes off Shouldn't it talk to, say, the gas appliances in your house? We built those also. And tell them to turn off pumping gas into your home if there's, a, if there's potentially a fire? So we thought it would be really cool to do that. Um, and, and, but if you're putting out 50 million devices a year, it might be good to have an address space that actually is going to last. So that. The second was stateless address auto configuration. It was important because if you talk to somebody who can't get their VCR, how many people know what a VCR is? OK, good. I hate to use that term these days because, you know, like kids are like, what's a VCR? You know, if, if a homeowner can't get their VCR to stop flashing 12, do you think they're really going to understand having to add DHCP addresses to something in order to make it work within their home? They're not. So stateless address auto configuration was really important. You don't have to require DHCP. We all know, I don't need to say it again, but I'll say it anyway, NAT is bad, um, and it would be great to stomp that out. So it was another good reason. But... Um, the last ones I think are, are well, stateless header compression also. I, I could go into the details, but I, I don't think we need to here. Um, it's important just because it allows you to have, um, Michael was just saying, in HomeNet, there's potentially lots of egress points for these sensors, right? They may be talking to a energy management system within the home. They may be talking to some other device that's doing some sort of aggregation of data, or they may be talking to the direct, directly through the internet. They may be going through LTE. They may be going through cable. They may be going through whatever. If you do stateful header compression, you have to either have all of those egress points some have, somehow have... Um, um, a, a known um, compression mechanism and share that compression data, or you want to use stateless header compression so that it can egress any point. And that's what um, 6 Lopan does and part of the reason IPv6. It's a problem with v4. You can't do it statelessly. Um, but then the other things, preserving end-to-end -end connectivity and, and uh, the idea of not having to have gateways. Um, you will hear me and anybody who's heard me speak over and over again, I rally against gateways. I rally against um, um, <coughs> proprietary protocols with some sort of translation gateway, then talking to the internet and claiming that's part of the internet of things. I maintain it's not because it breaks end-to-end -end connectivity and end-to-end -end security. If you look at Zigbee, Zigbee says, and sorry, you'll see I pick a lot on Zigbee, but it's a nice big easy target. Um, 
if you look at Zigbee, they say, well, we have a gateway. You take Zigbee into this thing, then you translate it and you send it out. Well, they have a security domain on one side and a security domain on the other. It becomes a single point of attack, a single point of failure. Really, really, really bad idea. Every time you rev the um, version of Zigbee, you have to rev the gateway. Again, go to a homeowner and explain to them that box that has um, uh, dust bunnies all over it, hidden behind whatever. You need to somehow plug in and provide new software for that. And oh, by the way, don't break anything else. And it has to work and, and whatever. It's, it's, a, it's a real mess. So gateways, breaking into end security are part of the reasons why I think I really feel that, um, and if so, from a uh, um, point of view, our goal is IP end to end um, uh, and IP to the very edge of the network. I've mentioned this, you know, again, breaking into insecure, um, multiple single points of failure. But in addition, right, they're complex to upgrade. They're complex to configure. We add security, and then, then there's all, always the added cost. Now, if you're a gateway manufacturer, you'll love that idea. Um, but if I'm a homeowner, I really don't want a whole stack of things. Why not use the device that's already in my home? My cable modem, my DSL modem, whatever it happens to be. It routes IP. It does it really well. It knows what it's doing. Plus, if we have IP, we understand we can build firewalls. Now, there's always this argument, oh my gosh, IP is insecure. I think everyone would here would argue IP is not insecure. It's the implementations of IP and it's how they're deployed is insecure. The protocol itself isn't. Right? The most secure networks in the United States run IP. Now, are they on the public internet? Well, probably not. They're on virtual networks. They're on virtual um, links and things like that. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about was the plethora of protocols that are being applied to the Internet of Things. Um, so I've already mentioned V6. We're all here for V6. Six, six low pan I've mentioned. For routing, we have a few different choices. Um, Ripple is one that the IETF has standardized for what we call low power lossy networks. Um, it's it's a routing over low power, R-O-L-L, routing over low power lossy networks. Actually, I like to call it routing over lousy links um, because that really was the goal. When you have a wireless network, it's a lousy link. Right? We all know it. Every time you try to get on Wi-Fi, when you were really desperate, like I was this morning, I had a bad inter internet connection. I was just like, ah, why is this happening to me? Um, so there's Ripple. Um, it really is, if, you look at, if, you're, if you're into this type of thing and you're looking at, at routing protocols, um, Ripple is what's known as a collection tree. So it's very good for many-to-one collections. So it's great for electric meters to talk back to a utility. It may be great for a sensor or a sensor network to talk back to something. It's really lousy in the other direction. So to that end, the HomeNet group, who Michael talked about, um, uh, is actually working on a couple of other um, and looking at a couple of other protocols. One's called Babel, and one is actually a, a long-term um, internet protocol, uh, routing protocol called IS to IS. And so they're looking at those things. The other debate that's going on within the community right now for the Internet of Things is um, what I termed a, a long time ago, route over versus mesh under. And what I, when, we, when you talk about over and under, it's from the point of view of IP. When I created 6LOPAN, my thought was mesh under. And what does that mean? That means that from a 6LOPAN node point of view, the network itself would look like a broadcast medium, look a lot like Ethernet, right? I drop a packet in, it may be a really lousy Ethernet, it loses packets, it's a little slower, there's greater latency, a lot more um, um, uh, jitter in, in delivery of packets, but I drop it in and automagically it makes its way to somewhere else. Everything is one IP within your home network or within your building network, everything is one IP hop away. This was a hugely simplifying um, uh, tool for us in building 6 Lopan because we didn't, have to, we didn't have to change any of the things above IP. IP expects that and it all just works. Unfortunately, some folks came along who said, no, no, that's the wrong way to do it. Um, what we really want to do is make every single um, IoT node be part of the routing fabric, and we route between all of these various things. Suddenly, we've broken a bunch of we, we've broken open a whole bunch of problems. Things like now, what does on link and off link mean? Right? We had a debate in Manet for five years um, uh, over what is on link and off link. You know, is a node because it's within your broadcast domain is that on link 
but because it's not really listening to you, does that make it off link? Um, this was, it, it's, it's actually, I think, a, a untenable problem and, and not actually fixable. Another one, Mike, another um, a debate over TCP versus UDP. Okay, now, if you think about it, you'd probably go, oh, UDP, right? It's a sensor. It's a datagram. It sends something out and it just goes back to sleep. Um, and, and I was in that camp. I really thought UDP was probably the exact right way to go. But then when you start to think about, well, wait a second. The problem with UDP is if you're sending data to a node, you can send a 65,000 byte UDP packet. What does, and I, I, I forgot to, I rushed out the door and I forgot to bring my little um, um, uh, show and tell piece, but I'll show it a little bit later as a slide. What does a little tiny sensor which has a 2K buffer do with a 65,000 byte packet? Right? It just, it can't possibly process it. And so it just throws it away, which means you've wasted a boatload of bandwidth to send it, to get this thing to that. You've wasted a boatload of bandwidth over your little tiny sensor network in order to get this thing there, and the thing can't do anything with it. What's really cool about TCP is you have window size negotiation. You can say, I can only accept X number of bytes in order to be able to process it. Now, you might argue, well, wait a second, Jeff. TCP requires a three-way handshake to set up a, a network. It requires a three-way three, three handshake to tear down a connection. Um, that's a lot of overhead in order to send maybe two bytes of data. Well, interestingly, I started looking at this, and I realized Google had half the answer, as usual. Um, Google something, right? They only give you half the answer. Um, Half the answer was you don't need a three-way handshake to tear down a TCP connection. Google, if you, if you run TCP dump or whatever you want to run, watch their connection. What they do when they tear it down, they do a fin reset. Every packet comes out, fin reset. One packet, boom, you're all done. This isn't a two-way thing. Boom, fin reset, we've sent you the data, we're all done. On the other side of it, some work that I did when I was back at this little company called Sun Microsystems, which doesn't exist anymore, we were figuring out how could we piggyback data over SINs, SYNACs, and ACs in the first part of the packet. And we found there, you can actually, most um, IP implementations, TCP IP implementations, will allow you to send data in the SYNAC um, initial setup, which means now I can send data um, uh, to a node, it can receive it all in one packet, it can send me a FINAC, and we can be all done. Okay, now, you actually can't combine, it would be really cool, right, if you could combine SYN, SYNAC, FIN, FINAC, or FIN reset all in one packet, but that doesn't work, unfortunately. It'd be kind of cool maybe in the next version of, of um, IP. So to that end, where was I going with all this? To that end, you can actually, TCP actually does make sense for sensor networks and, and can be used, and we shouldn't just dismiss it. Um, then uh, DTLS, how many people have heard of DTLS? It's basically TLS for UDP. Um, and, and so now we're looking at, there's a working group within the IETF called DICE that's looking at how do we do DTLS for constrained environments. HTTP versus COAP. Um, how many people have heard of COAP? Okay, a few people. What's wrong with this side of the room? They keep raising, why do all of you know about these things? Has, has it just, I've been here too many times? Shake your head. Okay. Oh, that's right, okay. That's your problem. <laughs> okay, um, HTTP versus COAP. COAP was a protocol that was developed in search of a problem. Um, not really, right? The idea was we could, we, we wanted, again, people thought, oh, we need to use UDP. You can't run um, HTTP over UDP. The mapping isn't there, so we need to invent something new, and we need something more efficient than HTTP, right? Because HTTP has these humongous headers. Well, no one bothered to actually look and say, what's the smallest amount of data that you can send that's actually a valid HTTP connection request? And it actually is only HTTP colon slash slash some information, and you have to send a host. But what's cool about IPv6 is you can say host colon colon one. Okay, so it's like three or it's like five extra bytes. Actually, the difference between the overhead of HTTP and the overhead of CoAP is only like 10 bytes. Now, in some situations, 10 bytes will make or break an application, but I'd say 99% of them, they won't. And the problem with co-op is there are no widespread co-op servers. Everything talks HTTP. Um, the problem is it's going to be years, if not decades, before Microsoft and Google and everybody else start to deploy things that actually talk native co-op. So what do you build? 
A gateway. Oh, wait a second. Let me go back five slides. Gateways are bad. <laughs> um, so this really isn't a great idea. And part of the, the whole thing that I've stood up for, for 10 years arguing about why IP end-to-end -end is because we don't have to reinvent everything. Right? If you go and you take Zigbee or you go and take Jeff Mulligan's greatest SNAZU um, sensor protocol, right? you find out at the end of the day, you're probably reinventing everything that's in IP. Oh, I move some bits around or whatever, but it's still all there. And what you have to do is now build all of the infrastructure. We've been arguing the whole reason for IP end-to-end -end is the infrastructure's there. We don't have to, we can utilize all of that. And yet, now we go along the lines of co-op and we have to say we have to um, put everything on top of it. So then this, this plethora of terms, MQTT, anybody heard of it? Um, it's, it's a, it, it, it is a um, data protocol for sensor type networks. It was developed by IBM, um, and they recently, in the past, I don't know, year and a half, put it out in public domain and are looking to get it standardized, and they've made it completely free and available. Um, alternatively, there's one called DDS, is which, which is from the um, Object Management Group, AMQP, XMPP, which anybody who's ever jabbered or anything else has used XMPP. Now people have thought, hey, we could apply that to the Internet of Things. And then my favorite, actually, is SNMP. I actually really like the idea of using SNMP for the Internet of Things, but no one seems to be catching on to that. So I think I have to build an implementation and, and show them. And then lastly, I want to talk about IPSO smart objects. Um, uh, again, I, I went over this already. Went over this. I did that. Um, again, negotiated window size and acts. Interestingly, right, uh, the other argument for UDP is, well, I just send it and I don't have to worry about it. I could go back to sleep, which is basically true. If I'm a temp sensor, if I'm a temp sensor in here and I'm doing building control, right, the temp sensor can just say it's 72 degrees and go back to sleep. But in or what we're finding out, in order to manage the power consumption on that thing, you want to receive something back in order to say, by the way, no one's in the room, don't wake up and tell me the temperature again for the next hour, right? I really don't care. Because waking up every five minutes, your battery's going to be dead. And what, we've tra what, what we're finding is, especially in large deployments and Zigbee deployments, what we're finding is all these battery-operated devi devices, we've, we've moved from an area of, of having network managers to battery changers. Honestly, at the, um, uh, what's the, the, the uh, one of, I, I, in, in Las Vegas, um, one of the hotels, I forget which one, maybe to be so that they can remain nameless, um, uh, they deployed a Zigbee network and they ended up finding that they had to now hire someone who all they did go around was constantly changing batteries because the things were just too chatty. There wasn't a mechanism to tell them to say, hey, we, we really don't care right now. Don't tell us what the temperature is. So you end up actually having to have some sort of acknowledgement anyway that you're getting, you know, that the data got there and that you want to give it some sort of answer and that, by the way, it is going to go to sleep for the next hour. And so when you're doing that back and forth anyway, all the things that you, you were, you end up recreating that in your, in every single application, whereas TCP just already, always, already had it. And I already mentioned um, uh, the beauty of, um, of being able to get rid, rid of the three-way handshakes. So, one of the things, though, um, if we're going to have an interoperable Internet of Things, it is a little different than um, what we have for the Internet. And, and how is that? It's because they're generally for an IoT device. You don't have a rich user interface. Right? The, the homeowner doesn't go to his thermostat and say, you know, I want to download this new app and put a different interface or this new thing to put on it to give it more functionality. The thermostat is the thermostat that you get. Um, and it's even worse than that. Um, Michael talked about the Nest thermostat, right? They, it, it talks to Nest, talks to their cloud. And interestingly, we seem to have this whole new era of things where we've moved from proprietary protocols to proprietary clouds. I have a thermostat from a company. I went out and bought it. It's a Wi-Fi thermostat. And I thought, this is fantastic. I got a Wi-Fi thermostat. I can write all sorts of apps. I know um, uh, Wi-Fi. I know HTT. I can do something with this thing. I plugged it in, turned it on. I couldn't find any open ports. Um, I actually ran Nmap against it, and it, and it bricked. Um, <laughs> I, I ended up, I mean, not even just a simple bricking. I ended up having to take it off the wall, pull the battery out, and short two pins together. Found it on the internet. Um, 
in order to di- discharge some capacitor and have it go into some like I know nothing about the world mode so that I could then plug the battery back in and, and start to do it again and realize that don't run Nmap. Um, but then I thought, well, okay, I'll try not doing Nmap, I'll try doing other things. It only, it every once in a while wakes up, and I won't tell you who it is, but it's a company that starts with H. Um, uh, it wakes up, talks to their cloud, um, gets information about what temperature you want or what your, your uh, current schedule is. It gets that and then turns off. There's no interface to it. Unless I want to, and this is what I'm working on right now, um, my, my DNS server lies about what their cloud server is so that I can try to get something in the middle and do something different. But I'm weird, right? No homeowner's going to do that type of thing to, in order to try to actually have control of the device they bought. What a strange idea. You could actually have control over the device you bought. Um, well, I, I should get away from that, right? I don't have control over my TiVo. Why should I expect to have control over my thermostat? Um, but we've moved to this, this, this idea that we're just going to shove everything up into some proprietary cloud. And I don't think that we're any better off. Um, one of the things I will disagree with, with Michael, well, actually a couple things I'll disagree with Michael, is, is that um, I think it is important right, for me to be able to choose maybe where I want my sensor data to go, not for the person I bought it from. Another uh, interesting um, uh, device is if you've been to Lowe's, right, there's a, a, um, you can buy the ISIS system. Really cool. They actually, some of the boxes, some of the devices in there do run IP, but they don't talk to anything except the ISIS gateway. The ISIS gateway doesn't talk to anything except the ISIS cloud. And frankly, the user interface to the ISIS cloud, sorry if anybody's here from Lowe's, it sucks. And I don't have any, I don't have any way to change it, right? I can't go and hire Owen and say, build something better for me because it's their stupid cloud. Um, and, and so we haven't gotten anywhere with that. Whereas if the device like we have on the internet today just talks IP and can talk to wherever it happens to be, I can build a really cool device out of that. And I'll explain, I'll talk about um, uh, another project a little bit later. So the point of all this is though, it's not just about getting IP and IP. That's like you and I, we have a phone and you speak French and I speak English. We're not still going to be able to communicate. Maybe we could say cheeseburger um, and, and get some understanding, but beyond that, we're not gonna have a real conversation. Um, so, and yes, there's a whole bunch of other protocols in between there, but for these objects, because they don't have a rich interface and I can't really program, a homeowner can't program them, we do need a set of, it would be great to have a set of open objects that are protocol agnostic. And so IPSO, the group um, I, I mentioned earlier, we created something called the IPSO Smart Objects. And, and it's both a framework for defining new objects. We did that and people went, okay, fine, how do I use it? Um, because it was a little, it's a little obtuse when you talk about data models and things like that. People kind of go, oh, okay. Um, so what we did was we created something called the IPSO Smart Objects Starter Pack. It's a set of smart objects that are defined through the Open Mobile Alliance. They're M to, um, lightweight M to M. There's a registry there. The objects define, um, the starter pack defines a set of objects for doing lighting control, for doing power management, for doing temperature. Does it define everything? Heck no. That's why I'm here, partly to see if, if, if there's something in your business that you'd like to see smart objects defined for, come to the IPSO, um, uh, come to the IPSO Alliance. We're defining now an extension pack. How do we extend it? We found there are things like we want to do some sort of inheritance so an object can be like another object. Now, I'm a little afraid. How many people did, you know, uh, got confused when Java and C++ and multiple inheritance and all of these other things? It, it's a little confusing. So I'm a little leery of that and we'll see how that all works out. But what's interesting is we are actually conducting the first um, IPSO Smart Object interop event in May in Stockholm um, in order to try different implementations. The Alliance landscape. Uh, Dan's standing up, so I better get, I stop. Okay, I'm good. I'm good. Okay, as I mentioned, the IPSO Alliance, we promote open standards across the IoT. Our goal is IP end to end. I don't care what the device is, I want it to run IP. Um, I, and I think that that's, that's the right solution. Even if you're going to aggregate data, why not have the thing talk IP? If it's a smoke detector, why not have it multicast out a message saying smoke, right? Then anything else in the home that happens to want to listen to that and react to it can do it. It can still talk to a gateway. 
I'm not precluding you from building a gate, and not, I shouldn't say a gateway. It can still talk to an a data aggregator to do something smart with that and to do some other things. But if it talks IP, there's a, there's a greater chance that you can build lots of other cool things that might be able to interact with it. Um, Ipso started out on why use IP. Right? We spent a lot of time trying to convince people, frankly, um, the, the US smart grid is going to be based on IP for a lot of reasons, but one of them is Ipso um, went out and lobbied utilities, lobbied the Department of Energy, and lobbied Congress to say, we don't want a whole bunch of stovepipes, a whole bunch of separate little things in every utility. Um, we really do need to use IP. Now, there's another group, in Industrial Internet Consortium. Like I said, it was started by GE. And the idea there is to define a set of protocols and security mechanisms for industrial applications. So for jet engines, for wind turbines, for, for um, uh, you know, large industrial systems. Their contention is, um, again, for, for interoperability, they're not the idea is not necessarily to define new protocols. In fact, we've been trying to explain to them they don't need to invent new things. What they need to do is define how you put those things together, sort of like um, a lamp stack for industrial applications. And, uh, so, and, and they seem to be going down that path. Open Internet, um, uh, Open Interconnect Consortium, um, be the beauty of that is they, well, actually both of those are IP-based. Um, industrial internet, you would hope that because it says internet, it would be IP-based. Sometimes that's not really true. Um, the Open Internet Consortium uh, is a number of companies that are, and what's really neat about them is the, the end deployment, the end product that they're going to put out will be open source. So everyone can download it. You don't need to, you don't need to join OIC in order to get a copy of the code in the stack and build something with it. If you want to get an OIC stamp of approval saying that your implementation is OIC um, certified and will is certified to work with other devices, then obviously you need to join OIC and 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 do that. Um, and I think that that's a benefit that they're they're offering. Now, unfortunately, as my previous um, uh, couple slides back, they are looking down the unfortunately the co-op path. Um, I'm trying to work with them to use HTTP, but we'll see. Anybody heard of the Thread Group? It was started by this other little group called Nest Labs and this little tiny company called Google. Um, and the idea was to create, uh, there's a radio network that Zigbee uses called 802.15.4. Um, and the problem is it has a very short range and you would like to build a network and fortunately they're taking this path of mesh under, which I think is the right thing to do, build a mesh network um, between a bunch of nodes within your home. It is right now confined, confined to the home with the idea of sensors and other controls that, are, that can talk back to other, you know, other devices like a Nest thermostat. Um, I know that, that Owen's working on something similar, um, so am I. If you think about a thermostat, right, it has three functions. It is a user interface, it is a sensor, and it is a controller. And it frankly is the worst of all three. Right? It is the worst design possible. My thermostat sits by my front door. Right? No one in my house lives by my front door. I never sit by my front door. I sit in some other room, yet my thermostat is working really hard to keep the temperature right by my front door at 68 degrees or whatever number I put it on. It's silly. We go upstairs and everything gets really hot because the thermostat's downstairs. We go to the basement and everything is really cold because the thermostat is upstairs. Wouldn't it be really cool if you could separate the temp sensors and put them all over the place and have them communicate back? The user interface, it sucks also. Right? My wife's like, well, I replaced my thermostat. Remember with the H1? She said, I used to set the old thermostat to 68. This one I have to set to 72. I tried to explain to her, it's just a number. It doesn't really matter. Set it to whatever. Set it to A, B. It, it doesn't matter. But she's obsessed with the idea that it needs to be set to 68. Again, it's a stupid interface. Why shouldn't it be on your phone? I, I'm sitting on my couch and I like to go, I'd like it a little bit warmer. I'd like it a little bit cooler. I'd like it to turn off because I'm trying to listen to something or whatever it happens to be. The user interface is awful. And then the control mechanism is stupid. It's mounted upstairs and my, 
heating and air conditioning is down in the basement. And oh, by the way, there's only three wires that can connect the, two, the three things. And if, if they aren't the right three wires, then I really can't do any type of real digital control. All I can do is tell it to turn on, tell it to turn off, and I can't do anything smart. So it would be awesome to separate those things. And that's part of the idea behind the thread group. Unfortunately, again, and I should probably quit tilting at this windmill, they're looking at co-op and DTLS. Open Mobile Alliance, I already mentioned them. It's a, we have a partnership. Ipso has a partnership with them. They publish a set of registries for um, devices, and, and we're, de we're working with them to develop a registry for IoT-type devices. AllScene, I know a little bit less about them. It was created out of the AllJoin, now the AllScene Alliance. AllJoin came out of Qualcomm. Um, there's a number of companies besides Qualcomm, another little company called Microsoft uh, that, that seems to be uh, backing and doing this, but there hasn't been a whole lot of um, work that's coming, coming out of it. 1M2M is another group that was created actually by um, a number of uh, communications companies, maybe mainly Japanese communication, um, telecommunications companies, in order to try to define a set of um, specifications for doing machine-to-machine um, -machine communication. Uh, there's a debate right now going on on whether they're, they're thinking to go down the path of something like Zigbee. Um, Ipso and, and I are trying to push them towards an IP-based solution. Um, so then one other thing about the, another thing about the IoT that, that I think we all need to start to look at and address is IoT security and privacy. I just did it, right? I conflated the two terms. Everybody sorts, sorts, sort of thinks when you talk about privacy and security, it's just one, that's one term. Right? It might as well just be privacy security. And it's not really. Security is a technology problem. How do we apply security protocols? How do we apply security tools to things? Privacy really is a policy issue that we want to use security to enforce whatever those policies are. And one of the things I think we need to do is divide this conversation. There are really, really smart people who can build encryption protocols and can do key management, but have a clue about what it means about privacy. And it would be great, to, and there are people that understand privacy, but having a clue understanding what AES is or um, uh, IPKE or any of the other things, right? So we want to try to separate these things and have a discussion over here to say we need strong private, we need strong encryption, um, but we need to understand how do we apply that properly to privacy issues. Unfortunately, like I said, I forgot to I forgot to bring in. If I was holding it up, it'd be about you can see it. It's about the size of a quarter. Um, this is a device that that I built with um, some other folks. It uses some Atmel parts and, and whatever. I have to use their name because they gave me the parts. Um, it's a coin. It runs on a CR2032, which is you know the little tiny coin cell battery. It has a 3D accelerometer, temp sensor, light sensor. It uses an 802.15.4 radio. It talks IPv6. Right. If there is a um, access point, I, a 15.4 access point, it talks to the internet. It's on. It, and, and we wrote a little app for it so that you can do a coin flip. When it's heads, you can ping it. When it's tails, it won't answer. So kind of cool. Anywhere in the world, you could know whether the device is on or off. Um, what's amazing, though, about it is it can actually run for the battery life, basically the shelf life of the, the battery, um, still talking V6. Talking all the time? Heck no. But talking sort of as often as it gets moved, yes. I attached one to my garage door. If, if anybody were, was here last year, I talked about an app that I, I, I built this thing. I attached it to my garage door. I attached another device to my garage door opener, and I was demoing it. I was in Korea, and I opened and closed my garage door at 3 a.m. in Colorado, and my wife called me up the next day and said, do that again, and you're going to have to find a new place to live. Um, she, and so as soon as I got home, I was happy to find that the locks weren't changed, but I did have to take at least the turner on or off or um, uh, open and close or off. And, um, but the other little device is still attached to my garage door, and I can tell whether my garage door is open or closed because of the orientation. It has a, it has a three, three axis accelerometer, so it understands whether it's in this position or whether it's in this position. But, but my point of that is I put that up, let's see, 20 in January of 2012, and it's still running. And I haven't changed the CR2032 battery. And that's even through these wonderful cold Colorado winters. So you can build an IP-based solution that runs on a battery for many, 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 many years. Um, so I will finish up here. Um, I want to mention how, you know, one of the things um, Dan said was, how can you get involved, right, in the IoT? And, and here's how. Um, IPSO, this is the third year of the IPSO challenge. 
we are, it's a global challenge to try to find cool, innovative ideas about IoT. And now, it's not just coming up with an idea. We expect you to build it. But we don't expect you to build it on your own. If you have a really neat idea and you can't get, say, a, a, a part or a dev kit, you don't have access to a beagle bone or a pie or something like that, um, if your idea is sort of innovative enough um, that it catches the eye of one of our sponsors, Atmel STTI Freescale, um, they will actually provide dev kits. If, if you have dev kits but you're looking for a really cool development environment, Micrium, who makes a real-time OS, will give you a license to use um, uh, their operating system to build something. It opened, it opened um, a couple weeks ago. We actually already have entries from India, Lebanon, Costa Rica, um, Sweden. Um, there's a couple more. And, and, um, and I was a little chagrined, only one from the U.S. so far. But I, I think we're just lazy or we like to do everything at the very last minute. Entries are open until July 15th. So um, we're giving away $25,000 in prizes, $10,000 first place. Again, the point, though, is you have to actually build it. Right? So like Owen just can't come up with a really cool, I keep picking on Owen, but he can't just come up with a, uh, I'll say David. David can't just pick a, a uh, to build a really cool thermostat or a um, aquarium monitor and say, this is what I want to do. He actually has to instantiate it. He has to actually build it. Um, the top 10 will get flown out to California where the final judging is going to be taking place. Um, like I said, new this year, we have both development and, and software um, available. We are also uh, about to announce a cloud service provider who is going to provide free access to their cloud service. You don't have to use it, but if you want it and you don't want to have to pay for something, it'll be available. There are some flyers um, outside if you're interested. Uh, and, and, or if you are, right, if you're smarter than me, which is probably likely about the IoT and you'd like to mentor, we're also looking for judges and mentors and we'd love to have you participate. So with that, thank you. Any questions? Yes. I have no idea how I'm doing on time. Any work uh, on cognitive radio implementing in the IoT space? Um, that, so that's interesting, right? Like software-defined radios? Software-defined with an IEEE specification that, that picks frequencies that are optimal for a location. I have, the, the problem, I would love to see that, but no, right? Because generally in, in, in most, well, I shouldn't say no, right? Never say never. Um, the, the problem has been so far that for a lot of the embedded applications, we are sort of limited to the availability of, of radio chips from the vendors. And low power radios for embedded applications seem to be in one of two flavors, 802.11 or 802.15.4. Um, now there's a couple new things on, on the horizon. If you've heard, there's something called Sigfox. Um, they have a proprietary closed environment for building low power, ultra narrow band communications over wide area. And another one called LoRa, L-O-R-A, um, which comes from Semtech. And they're doing a wide area communications, again, using a slightly different frequency, uh, slightly different design. Um, but so unfortunately, the big players, right, Atmel Freescale TI, um, all of those folks have chosen to either they, you know, or ARM, you either get a, a chip with Wi-Fi, um, Ethernet, or 802.15.4. And so having a software-defined front end on those things, it's a second chip, which then sort of goes against this idea of, of really low cost. I think it's a great idea, but I haven't seen anything yet. Other questions? Quick Googling and, and, and ask a question. Okay, if there's nothing else, I appreciate it. Thank you very much.